So, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Ahmad wa salli ala Rasul al-Kareem. Today, I want to talk about Dhul Qarnayn and whether if he may have done intergalactic uh, space travel. Now, I'm going to show you an article that talks about this. We're going to read this article and then I'm going to analyze the article. And the reason to do this is that people who love Qur'an, read Qur'an, they can consider... Uh, the principles of interpretation and one very good uh, brother I respect uh, he's done a lot of positive work for the deen may Allah bless him and continue him uh, put out a video in the Urdu language that became quite popular and viral that Zulqarnayn uh, in his opinion definitely definitely did this intergalactic traveling and so uh, people started asking me, I think six months ago, questions about that. And then, you know, and then I thought, you know what, it would be good to, and then I went back in the last few days and listened to what was actually said so that I can understand the point of view of the speaker. Okay. So that's what I want to do first. I want to give you the point of view of the speaker. And then I'm going to give you an analysis of uh, of that uh, based upon the dictionaries that we have in 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 the in, in the tafsirs that we have and what is actually being said now uh, first i want to give you the point of view that zulqarnain alayhi salam that he did uh, intergalactic travel and i want to start off with the quran of course and then we'll go to this article that mentions this and then i'll mention some of the other proofs that the brother uh, who mentions this, uh, some of the other proofs I heard from him, and then I'll address those along with the article. And then I'm going to do an analysis, and this will be beneficial for serious students of Qur'an. Okay? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Yes, Aluna ka anthil qarnain. They ask you about dhul qarnain. Okay? So people are asking the Prophet sallallahu So the questioner has a certain intention and motive that they have in mind. Okay? I will tell you, Allah says, we will reveal to you, we will tell you something about him. We established him on the earth. And we gave him for all things a sabab. Okay. So he followed the means or the cause. And this word sababa will become very important in understanding the point of view that he went on an intergalactic, um, you can say, traveling. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, inshallah look at this article, Zulqarnain's Space Travel. And uh, so now let me go down here and I'll start from here. Uh, and they ask you about Dhulqarnayn, say, I will recite to you about him a report. Indeed, we established him upon the earth, and we gave him to everything a way, a sabab. Okay, this is going to be a very important part of the perspective of those that would hold that Dhulqarnayn went into an intergalactic uh, journey. So he followed Fa'atba'a sababa. So he followed a sabab, a path. Okay, a uh, and then again we'll talk about this word. Dhulqarnayn is granted sabab by God. Although it is merely translated as a way, as you know one of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, is also Musabib al-Asbab, the one who is the cause of the causers, right? He's the cause of all causing. So, uh, sabab means cause. So the word sabab is crucial for understanding this story because it is versatile of its versatile meaning and its repetition throughout the story okay so let me just show that to you that uh why somebody who would focus on this word why they would do that so you have the word sababa in ayah number 84 then you have fa'atba'a sababa again ayah number 85 right and you have thumma atba'a sababa Again, in ayah number 89 and in ayah number 92. So that is 1, 2, um, 3, 4 times 
the word sababa is used. Okay, so it's clearly a, a very important word in this story. There's no doubt about it. So, <clears throat> the word sabab is crucial for understanding this story because it is versatile meaning and its repetition throughout the story. According to the original ta'us, taj ta'arus, the original meaning of sabab is a rope that is used to climb a palm tree. I'm going to maybe also show you, um, maybe I could show you the Arabic dictionaries, but I'm also going to show you the English dictionaries. We'll see, inshallah, how much time. Namely, it means to reach something high and above. Zaid bin Aslam has explained the meaning of this word in the Quran, meaning a way to heaven. The word sabab is mentioned five times in the Quran. In four of them, it is used in the meaning of means to reach the heavens. Okay, uh, I will explain this. I will show you the, the it's more than five times. The word sababa itself uh, is used in this particular form only in this place. But anyhow, I will go into the word sabab and its details and all the various ahadiths and look at this. Or is there dominions of the heavens and the earth and what is between them? Then let them ascend, okay, through any ways of access. This is Sutu Sa'ad and then Fir'aun, O Haman, construct for us a tower that I meet, may reach the ways, the ways into the heavens, so that I may look at the deity of Moses. And then again, in Sutul Hajj, wherever, whoever has ever sur uh, surmised that God will never give him victory in the present life and the hereafter. Give him victory is meaning Allah will help them. Then let them extend forth a means to the heaven and there off thereafter. Let him cut it off. This word is bab is used in other places in Quran too, but I'll come to that in a little bit. The usage of this word in this fashion throughout the Quran suggests that the the that the sabab that is followed by Zulqarnain led him to heavens. So his proof is that not only does the word sabab uh, mean going into the heavens but then he's also quoting is what a serious scholar would do other ayat of quran that use this word and has the meaning of going into heavens okay so he followed the asbab into the heavens okay so this is one of the major reasons why um this particular brother he feels that it is about talking about intergalactic travel Okay. Before looking into the details about Zulqarnain's story, we should have a look at the Milky Way galaxy to envision the journeys more easily. Okay, uh, This image depicts for us the Milky Way according to the latest scientific data and is taken from a completely secular source. Okay, So you see this uh, kind of like, uh, right, the, there's the black hole, which he's going to talk about. And uh, there is uh, the molecular clouds. Right in this, uh, and then there is the um, the arms. Okay, so it says until he reached the setting place of the sun, he found it setting in a spring of dark uh, of dark mud, Ainil Hamia, and found it near it a people. The sun does not set on Earth; it actually it it is actually in space when we see its setting. So it is impossible to define anywhere where the sun sets on the face of the Earth. In order to understand where the sun literally sets, we need to know where it bounds for. The Quran gives us an answer in Surah Yasin. The sun runs its course towards a stopped point. That is the determination of the exalted, the Almighty, the All-Knowing. According to this verse, the sun is moving towards its stopping point, which in Surah Gahaf refers to a setting point. Actually, this is uh, not completely correct when you look at the Hadith. Uh, of the Prophet وسلم, in the ayah that he quoted of Surah Yasin in here, right? وَالشَّمْسُ تَجْرِينِ مُسْتَقَرٍ لَهَا ذَلِكَ تَكْدِيرُ الْعَزِيزِ الْعَلِيمِ وَالْقَمَرَ قَدَّرْنَاهُ مَنَازِلَ حَتَّى عَادَكَ الْعُرْجُونِ الْقَدِيمِ وَالشَّمْسُ تَجْرِينِ مُسْتَقَرٍ لَهَا ذَلِكَ تَكْدِيرُ الْعَزِيزِ الْعَلِيمِ That particular uh, verse of the Quran is referring to when it reaches its final destination in terms of its complete journey, not its daily journey, in terms of the sun setting every day. It's not referring to that. And that is when 
the day of judgment will happen. Okay. Uh, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. So now, uh, but anyway, he quoted this. According to this verse, the sun moves towards its stopping point, which is the Gah refers to the setting point. The This course is called solar apex in astronomy, and we assume that Dhul-Qarnayn went towards the solar apex until he reached its end. What he witnessed at the end is even more intriguing. He witnessed Shams, a word that can refer to any star, although uh, the translations usually use sun. Now, see, the thing is, that the Quran uses the word Najm, stars, for stars, and Shams for our star, meaning our sun. But anyway, this is how uh, he is going to build the argument. He witnessed Shams, a word that can refer to any star. No, because the Quran has a specific terminology. For example, Yusuf wasalam, he says, Ya Abati, O my dear father, Inni ra'aytu ahad ashra kawkabaw. O my son, um, uh, O oh my father, I see 11 stars. Kawkab. Was shams and uh, the shams, which is this sun. Wal qamar in the moon. So all the other stars are known as either kawkab or najum or najam. And our sun, the one that we see every day, is called shams in Quran. But we're going to continue with this story as it is. Okay. So, he witnessed Shams uh, setting in Ain al Hamiya, which usually is translated as a dark, a spring of dark, dark mud, but can correspond to black hole in contemporary terms. Okay. Uh, over here, the principle has to be that when you make something, when you give an interpretation, particularly a metaphor in, interpretation, you have to prove your point. But we're going to talk about that maybe later. What is usually translated as a spring of dark mud 1,400 years ago, Ain al Hamiya, is a great expression to describe it, meaning the galaxy with the black hole in the middle. Ain means eye in Arabic. Eyes and black holes are very similar in the sense they both are holes that absorb light. Well, that's, that's a good explanation. But keep in mind, Ain also means a well, like Ain al Jariya in Quran, and the wells that, the springs that will be overflowing. The word Ayn means eye in Arabic. Eyes and black holes are very similar in the sense that they're both holes that absorb light. We can think of the solar apex as a train that ends up in a in a black hole. And our sun is in the middle of this train. The black hole that is mentioned in the verse, by the way, there's another verse that mentions black holes in Sutul Waqiyah. فَلَا أُقْسِمُ بِمَوَاقِئِ النُّجُمْ وَقَعَ means to occur. And waqa is very similar to the word sababa because the word sababa means to cut or to reach a place, like a cause. To either you use a cause to cut something, or you or to stop something. Like you turn on the switch, you reach something. You turn off the switch, you turn off the light. Right. So the word sababa has both meanings: to cut something off, right? Qata'at bihibul asbab. That day, all of their relationships will be cut off. All of their means will be cut off. And the word uh, sababa means to reach a point, like to reach to water is one meaning. To reach through the desert is another meaning, which is also interesting because in the first journey he reaches water. In the second journey he goes through the desert where, according to at least traditional you know, uh, explanation, that, that is what is happening. And it also fits the word sababa. But I'm going to come to that in more detail in a little bit. But when you say... Uh, Ain al uh, uh, you know, the you can say it means muddy uh, eye, or it can mean dark eye, or it can mean a dark well, or a black well, so on and so forth. Which usually translated as a spring of dark mud, but can correspond to black hole in contemporary terms. Considering that there wasn't any Arabic word for black hole 1,400 years ago, Ain al Hamiya is a great expression to describe it. The word Ain means eye in Arabic. Eyes and black holes are very similar in the sense they're both are holes that absorb light. We can think of solar apex as a train that ends up in the black hole, our sun in the middle of the, this train. The black hole that is mentioned in the verse is most likely the super massive black hole that is located at the center of the Milky Way. Okay, so um, so his first journey is on this side, 
and and he found near it a people. God said, O Zalqarnain, either you torment them or adopt them uh, or adopt them a way of goodness. Okay. So now uh, he found there a people. Okay. The bizarre point in the second part of the verse is the word Adha, punishment. Okay. Why would God allow Zulqarnain to torment these people? Uh, this is a straw man argument. It's not an argument at all because uh, it's like saying, why would Allah allow a king to torment a people? You know, well, a, a king is allowed to do that. So it could be what he's saying, but it doesn't have to be what he's saying. Why would Dhul uh why would God allow Dhul to torment these people? The answer is simple. These people were approaching the black hole along with their star. They would have ended up in the black hole if Dhul hadn't saved them. And this surely would be a torment. He said, as for one who wrongs, we will torment him. This same word is used by Sulaiman when he was talking to the bird. Then he will be returned to his Lord and he will be tor he will torment him with a terrible punishment. But as for the one who believes and does righteous, he will have a reward of paradise, and we will speak to him from our uh, we will speak to him from our command with ease. Then he followed atba, he followed a sabab, okay, until he came to the rising of the sun. He found it rising on people for whom uh, they did not have any shield. Thus we had em encompassed all that he had in knowledge. These verses talk about the second journey of Dhul Qarnayn and this time the journey is towards the opposite direction where the solar, uh, uh, towards the solar antipex. This, the expression of having no shield against the sun, gives the impression that the planet of these people lacked an atmosphere for the atmosphere is a shield between creatures and the sun. The atmosphere reflects back the harmful radiations emitted from the sun and therefore it is a shield between us and the sun. Dhul Qarnayn came to the birthplace of the sun and he probably visited a newly formed planet that doesn't have an atmosphere yet. Another possible interpretation is that since God likens the night to cover uh, sur uh, surrounding us in a couple of verses, having no shield against the star would mean living in a planet where where it gets it never gets dark this is scientifically possible if there is a binary star that revolves in a particular period so what he's saying is there's a planet and on this side and this side both sides there's a star most stars in the universe approximately 85 percent are binary star, star systems one thing that is certain is that he went to the far forming region of the galaxy so he went this time to the second journey to the other side okay then he followed Atba'a Sababa until he reached between the two barriers, Saddain. He found close to them a people who almost did not comprehend speech. This is the third journey of Dhul Qarnayn. If we probe into this verse, we can see that the word Saddain, which is translated as barrier, causes some controversy. Despite the fact that many translators assume this word to denote mountains, it is only a hypothesis. Since the Arabic language does not incorporate vowels, there is also a controversy in how this word should be read. The Qirat scholars, except Asim, have read this word as Suddain. Sudda. And means that the invisible barrier cloud flog, according to the ancient dictionaries, Asim has read the word as Saddain, which means the, con uh, the concrete and visible barrier, according to ancient dictionaries, in order to grip a more accurate insight we can have another look at Surah Yasin where Allah says, وَجَعَلْنَا مِنْ بَيْنِ أَيْدِهِمْ sadda or Sudda, both. وَجَعَلْنَا مِنْ بَيْنِ أَيْدِهِمْ سَدَّ وَمِنْ خَلْفِهِمْ سَدَّ فَأَكْشَيْنَاهُمْ فَأَمْ لَا يُبْسِرُونَ This verse should also be read as Sudda because the barrier that God depicts here is an invisible barrier that obstructs the vision of disbelievers' hearts. We all know that disbelievers are not enclosed by concrete barriers since these two verses are subject to the same controversy they should be read the same way and have the same meaning considering the above mentioned meaning of sudda and saddain we can now see that there is a term that corresponds exactly to suddain in astronomy nebula zulkanain must have reached a planet between two nebulas in space during this third journey this second sided nebula may be a, the double helix nebula that is located near the center of our galaxy. 
They said, O Dhul Qarnayn, indeed Ya'juj and Ma'juj are corruptors in the land. Okay, this is the trans, but it says, Inna Ya'juj wa Ma'juj la mufsiduna fil ard. And I'll tell you why this word ard becomes important here, because it's also mentioned more than once in this uh, story. So, may we assign for you an expenditure, may we pay you, okay, that you might make between us and them a barrier. We came across the word Sudda again in this verse. The people of whom Dhul Qarnayn spoke to in this planet asks him to make an invisible barrier against Gog and Magog. The concept of invisible barriers may be represented by missile defense shields or antivirus programs in contemporary terms. The word Ard that is translated as land doesn't have to refer to the earth. It can refer to any piece of on which it is said. This is the position of scholars of Islam. Number ayah number ninety-five. In that, uh, he said, in that which Allah has established me is better, but assist me with strength, and I will make between you and them a barrier. Radma. The word makkani is derived from makkan, which means to place. So this verse ha has a meaning where God put me is better embedded in. It alludes to the first verse of this story. Indeed, we established him upon earth and we gave him everything away. So by looking at these two verses, we can deduce that Dhul Qarnayn thinks the earth is better than their planet and he wants to return to earth after his job is over. Although people ask him to make a sudda, Dhul Qarnayn tells them he is going to make a radam, which means multiple layers of barrier. One of the meanings of it mentioned in old dictionaries such as Nisan al-Arab, a cloud of multiple layers. Then he says, bring me sheets of iron until we have leveled them between the two cliffs. He said, blow uh, until he had made it like fire. He said, bring to me that I may pour over it copper. This verse is supposed to describe how the barrier is built. However, it doesn't resemble any of the walls on earth. This is what he's saying. A number of scholars have stated that this wall is impossible to be built, especially in the poor technology of those times. Therefore, this should be regarded as a miracle of Qarnayn. Some scholars, include, uh, including Muhammad Hamid Yazir, have told that this barrier is probably figurative rather than substantial one. We know that Gog and Magog will surmount their barrier in the end times and attack whole mankind, as stated in subsequent verses. Gog and Magog were not able to surmount, nor could they pierce it. Uh, and then, and this is the mercy of my Lord. And when the promise of my Lord comes, He will make it, uh, make it pounded into dust. And the promise of my Lord has always been true. Also in Surah Al-Anbiya, until Gog and Magog are let through, and they swift, uh, they swarm swiftly from every elevated place. However, we know that there is no barrier on earth that confines a huge number of people. Even if there were, it could have been surrounded by planes and techno technological equipment according to the prophetic tradition Gog Magog outnumber the rest of the human the world population so those who believe that this barrier is located on earth have to accept that today there are billions of people on earth who are confined in walls and are unknown to the rest of mankind they also must believe that these people who don't have any trace or any technology will overpower whole mankind during a war one doesn't have to be a genius to realize the barrier of Gog and Magog is nowhere on earth since we know every inch of the earth in this century. Actually, that's not true. That's actually factually not true. The process, especially for the deep seas and stuff, but that doesn't really have anything to do with this. But the proce process being mentioned here is actually a chemical process. The iron hot is the great ca catalyst and is a reaction with molten copper gives out methane and hydrogen gas as long as one blows oxygen to it. The verb in the verse also implies blowing. Therefore, we can infer that the process creates hydrogen and methane, two very flammable gases. These two ga these gases are very light. They immediately fly up and usually give escape to other planets, and is usually escape to other planets with bigger masses because of their force of attraction. This is called atmospheric escape in astronomy and this has been the main reason why the moon doesn't have an atmosphere. The gases on the moon can easily fly over to the earth. That is why the earth's atmosphere is partly imported from the moon. 
the gases that Zulkarnain created might have passed over to the planet of Gog and Magog that might have formed multiple layers of gases in this planet, just like the word Rodma implies. We cannot know what kind of protection this atmospheric barrier would provide unless we acquire more knowledge about the planet of Gog and Magog. It is possible that this barrier obscures the vision of Gog and Magog by preventing the sunlight from penetrating into the planet. Let's have a look at the prophetic narration describing the barrier of Gog and Magog. <coughs> the prophet said, Gog and Magog are digging every day until they almost see sunlight. Then when one is in charge of them, says, we will go go back, we will dig to, again tomorrow. Then God restores the barrier, makes it stronger as it was. This will continue until the appointed time. This narration favors the opinion that this barrier is made of gas. A concrete wall wouldn't prevent sunlight from coming in because it wouldn't it would engulf wouldn't engulf Gog and Magog completely. However, the narration suggests that Gog and Magog are deprived of sunlight. Moreover, restoring concrete barrier every day would be impossible. On the other hand, a barrier that is made of gas would restore itself spontaneously since gases can flow and fill up every hole that is made in them. Now, our planet might be approaching the planet of Gog and Magog and their next target is going to be our planet when these two planets come close to each other and when God lets them penetrate through their barrier. You may think this is an interpretation is, is over-dependent but interpretation rather than the scripture. However, the conventional interpretation depends substantially on interpretation rather than scripture as well. Lulkanen is conventionally regarded as a powerful king with huge armies, although the scripture doesn't mention any of these. Now, let us mention some narrations that support our view in regards to Gog and Magog. Gog and Magog are a people who have the height of an average man, Okay, on their on their hands they have claws instead of nails. They have molars and canines as predators. Large ears, one of which serves them in as bed, and the other cover where no man or woman among them whose death is not known in advance. A woman does not die before having given birth to a thousand children. The same goes for men. They are from an unusual children of Adam. That is, Adam had a wet dream, the semen intermingled with the earth, and they were created from the earth. These narrations illustrate that Gog and Magog have non-human features. The narrations that state they have only one parent and they produce rapidly might allude to asexual production. It is very likely that Gog and Magog are extraterrestrials as far as descriptions of their physical appearances are concerned. Describing space travel with the vocabulary that belongs to 1,400 years ago at times when even the phenomenon of space wasn't known, it wasn't known is very difficult. On top of that is the description. The, this description must be implicit, so it shouldn't bother nor confuse anyone who's reading it at those times. We should keep in mind facts in mind while elevating the story of Dulqarnayn. This perspective I tried to articulate here is one of the perceptions that cast light upon the Dulqarnayn. The story of the planet. One can also argue that these journeys were not only space travels, but also time travels. I strive to present to you what I found most convincing among these opinions. I believe the Quranic verses infinitely contain infinite layers of meaning that cannot be understood by everyone reading them. The multiple different interpretations can be valid at the same time for a single verse. I do not claim that this is the only true interpretation of those verses describing the Quran's journey, but at least it should open up new perspectives in your mind god knows best so mashallah uh this is the article now let me uh come back to the um let me just summarize what has been said here so that when i give uh my uh my um but when I show you the sources that I'll be referring to, then you'll have a different perspective, and then you can decide between the two, and uh, and then we'll take it from there. Number one is the word sababa. Okay, the word sabab or sababa has many meanings, but this author pre pre uh, presents one meaning, which is to go into heavens. Okay, and then. Once you assume the person going to heavens, okay, 
then he shows this uh, the the Milky Way galaxy and shows that it seems to fit the story of going to the different sides of the galaxy and so on and so forth. And then uh, he talks about Ain al Hamiya, like the black hole, okay, the Ain, the like the eye and the big in the center that absorbs light just like the human eye does. And then uh, he talks about uh, there was a people that had no shade. Because maybe they were living in a planet that had suns on both sides. Um, and uh, then after that, he gives the example of Ya'juj and Ma'juj uh, being human beings living on another planet who are kind of like deformed. And, uh, they, and then another very good point he mentions uh, okay. is that they will have a large population and compared to human beings, is what the brother stated in this article and uh, then also that uh, their description is kind of like extraterrestrial and uh, and that they might come near our planet and then take over our planet and so on and so forth okay so this is kind of like uh, if I read the article and so now let me now address the situations accordingly okay so the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to look at the word sababa and see if that fits uh, into this story but actually before we look at this story we're going to look at the first verse of the sutul uh, kahf on this regard inna makkanahu fil ard we established him on earth okay here earth means earth because i think everyone will agree he went from this earth to the other place wherever you say either in this earth to one land to another land so in namakannahu fil ard ard can mean land it can mean the whole of the earth could mean any place okay but we established him on earth now please look at the other verses in the quran where this exact terminology is used throughout the quran so it's an idiom of the quran you can say and it is a uh, terminology of the Quran. So Allah says, Alam yarawkam ahlakna min qablihim min qarnin makkannahum fil ard. Just keep this in mind, okay? In, I, in another verse of the Quran, okay? Makkannahum fil ard ma lam numakkin lakum. We established them on earth as we never established you, meaning Quraysh. Walaqad makkannakum fil ard wa ja'anna lakum fiha ma'aish. We established you on earth, meaning you are to remain on earth. You are to be in earth. Then Allah says about Yusuf alayhis And this is how we established Yusuf on earth. Again, Allah mentions this. We established you on earth. And we gave him the path. We established him on earth and we gave him the path to everything. Whatever Allah established me in, meaning the earth, huwa, it is better. Meaning the power in this world uh, than what you have, those people that he was helping. But I'm now, even though I have power, but I'm asking you to help me. This was part of his leadership qualities, that when he was helping a people, he would ask them to participate. This is about khilafa on earth. Inni ja'ilun fil ardi khalifa. I'm going to make a khalifa on earth. So Allah says, Ida alladhi, those khulafa, the true khulafa, makkannahum fil ard, when we establish them on the earth, aqabu salah, they establish the prayer. Then Allah says about the deen of Allah, to be on earth, wala yumakkinanna lahum deenahum alladhir tada lahum. And we will make firmly for them their deen on earth, that Allah is pleased with them. Wala yumakkinan lahum fil ard. And we will make it strong for them on the earth. Okay. And then this continues. Okay. And makin, which is one of their, what does it mean? It means to be in a place. Okay. Thumma ja'alnahu nutfatan fi qirarin makin. And then we made the sperm sit in the womb of the mother in a secure place. Faja'alnahu qiraran makin. Di quwwatin in the dhil arshil makin. He's secure. In fact, about this one verse of uh, the Quran, when the Prophet ﷺ asked Jibreel ﷺ that, you know, 
uh, I got the Quran from you, but did you ever get anything from me? Because uh, the Prophet said to Jibreel in a narration, uh, the Prophet said to Jibreel that Allah has called me Rahmatul lil Alameen. I'm a mercy to all mankind. So, O oh, Jibreel, did you ever get anything from me? Meaning, how has my Rahmah affected you? You're the one who's always teaching me, right? So, Jibreel والسلام, read this verse of the Quran. The quwwatin in the dhil arshil makin. The quwwah, the one with power in the dhil arshil makin. Okay, he is uh, in the dhil arsh. He is with the arsh. Makin, he's secure. He said, I never knew I was secure by my Rabb because he used to pray. Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam used to pray because after what happened to Iblis, Rabbi la, uh, la tubaddil badni wa la tubaddil jismi wa la tubaddil ismi. Oh, كما قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم. Oh, Allah, don't change my body, don't change my name. Like what happened to Shaytan. But he said, when this verse came down, I got like uh, I got security in my heart that inshallah I'll be okay. Okay. So this is now giving you the understanding of this word, the very first word, إِنَّا مَكَّنَّاهُ فِي الْأَرْضِ Indeed, we established him in the earth. Meaning, whenever this word makanna lahu or makanna hum or makanna hum fil ard wa mak wa inna makan makanna Yusuf fil ard we establish Yusuf on the earth. Whenever this is mentioning the word tamakun or makanna, it means to secure someone in that place. So he was secure in that land that he was in. And he was secure in that earth that he was in. And we gave him وَآتَيْنَاهُ مِنْ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ And we gave him مِنْ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ سَبَبًا And we gave him the asbab of everything. One of the big mistakes um, this brother made uh, in his discourse is that he cherry-picked the ahadith that he thought fit his opinion. And throughout the rest that disagreed with his opinion. So for example, Sababa, وَآتَيْنَا مِنْ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ سَبَبًا Some of the scholars said it meant knowledge, not like an actual pathway. And the word Sababa has many, many meanings which I'm going to show you. But the brother said that in the Qur'an this is used in the sense of reaching the heavens. So let's look at that and then that will give you a better uh, understanding, inshallah. Allah says, وَلَا تُصُبُّ الَّذِينَ يَدْعُونَ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ Don't curse. Sabba yusabbi means to make connection to and also to cut off. So when you curse someone, you cut yourself off from them. Okay. لَا تُصُبُّ الَّذِينَ يَدْعُونَ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ فَيُصُبُّونَ اللَّهَ عَدُوًّا بِغَيْرِ عِلْمٍ Don't cut yourself, meaning don't curse other gods other than Allah because they will then curse your Rabb. And Allah doesn't deserve that, that you do something that they then end up cursing your Allah, who's the real Allah. In another verse, is When those people who followed will declare their independence from the people that were leading. When they see the punishment. And their means will be cut off. Their relationships will be cut off. Okay, Now, إِنَّا مَكَّنَّاهُ فِي الْأَرْضُ وَآتَيْنَاهُ مِنْ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ سَبَبًا We gave him the means to all things. Now, فَأَتْبَعَ سَبَبًا فَأَتْبَعَ سَبَبًا فَأَتْبَعَ سَبَبًا Now, in this context, it can have two meanings. We established him on the earth and we gave him the power to cut everything. Like he did with, uh, with uh, Ya'juj and Ma'at. He cut their, their pathway. And then he followed the path or he cut off the path. Both meanings from a linguistic perspective are correct, as you will see in Shalat Now, the brother was saying that this word sababa is used in regards to the heavens. So, for example, فَالْيَمْدُدْ بِسَبَبًا إِلَى السَّمَاءِ So let him get a rope from the sama, from the high above. And if you feel Allah is not going to help you, okay, or over here, ثُمَّ uh, Okay, then let him kill himself. 
if you think Allah is not going to help you in, in, in any of your situations in life, then get a rope and hang yourself. So, sabab here means rope, but it also can mean the idea of cutting yourself. Again, about the heavens. وَقَالَ فِرْعَوْنُ يَا هَمَانُ بْنُ لِي سَرْحًا لَعَلِّي أَبْلُوَ أَسْبَابٍ Oh, Fir'aun, uh, and Fir'aun said, Oh, Haman, make me a tower that I might reach the أَسْبَابَ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ The ways to the heavens and the earth. So, the meaning of asbab has relevance to what the brother is saying. But it is not the only meaning as I'm going to show you. Sometimes, uh, Okay. So, asbab means means or cause. It also means pathway. So, all these meanings are there. To understand which meaning is most appropriate, you will have to look at the context in which that word is used. So, now we know that Dhul Qarnayn was established on earth. So therefore, the asbab, the causes or the means that are given to him, will be for the earth. Okay, having said this, now let us continue in understanding this. Now looking at the word sababa, okay, uh, sabab, as I said, it means to reach or to cut off. It has both meanings and both means having means to do something, okay. So if you look over here, for example, okay. Uh, he reviled him, reviled him, reproached him, defamed him. Okay, and uh, the second means to uh, mean or cause of attaining or accomplishing a thing and an affair. Sabab Allahu laka sabab khaira. May Allah appoint for you or make for you or prepare for you a means of attaining good. Okay, asbab again. Qat'at bihim al asbab means to cut off. Okay. He reviled him. Now, obviously, somebody who's reading the story of Zulqarnain is going to say, I don't think sababa here means to cut off, even though everything in Quran does apply if the word is used by Allah. So, like, for example, him cutting off Ya'juj and Ma'juj. So, uh, but the then if you look at the other meanings, so you will have to now establish, so there are a few things that we'll have to remember as we talk about this, that, yes, there is uh, narrations, that mention about him going into the heavens. This is cannot be denied. And those narrations connect with the Quran if you take the word sababa mean to mean going into heavens. So there, there's definitely a connection there. But when you look deeper, you're going to find that the word sababa is cannot contradict what the verse before it, which is what? Inna makkannahu fil ard. We established him on the earth. And so now we know that whatever asbab he has, whatever sabab he has, must be the one on earth, not against the earth. So if you do that, then you will be putting a weak hadith over Quran. And this is what uh, has been done. You, so the word sababa doesn't necessarily mean going into heavens, as you will see very clearly here shortly. And if you say, okay, that hadith is talking about him going to heaven, but what about all the other da'if hadith that talk about him being in the land, him being a king on, on land, or even their narrations about him being an angel, there are other narrations about, you know, so there are many, about 15 different narrations about Huzul Qarnayn in the hadith literature. Uh, or from the Athar. So, first of all, we will take those 15 and tr tr filter them against Quran. So, the Quran says we established him on earth. And we gave him the cause and the means for everything, meaning on earth. And we gave him the knowledge to do things, even extraordinary things on earth. Now, let's continue. Tasabbab means it was, became, made, appointed, prepared, Okay, and a means or a cause of attaining or accomplish a thing or an affair, followed by amr. It was or became caused or occasioned. You say sabab al malu ghani, the property of the, uh, uh, the property of spoil of acquisition tribute fay was caused or occasioned to, acc to acc uh, accrue. Okay, then if you good, it means means and cause of attaining accomplishing. 
Okay, and this you find the same, uh, by the way, in the Arabic dictionaries. Okay, if I have to, then one day, inshallah, we'll go into that also. Uh, the two cut each other is also uh, reviled each other, reviling. Uh, he severed his ties. Okay, so like I said, sometimes Arabic meanings have two opposite meanings from the same root, and in this case, it means to reach or to attain or to connect or disconnect. Okay, when you revile someone, you make fun of someone, you're cutting yourself off from them. Okay, uh, let's continue, inshallah, in this dictionary. Uh, um, okay, and this also means a I witness many people of Auf alighting during their journeys. Okay, so now over here, uh, going repeatedly to and fro to see, uh, z uh, zib raqan. Okay, uh, for it was a custom of the chief of the Arabs to dye their turbans with saffron, and some say the uh, the meaning is his ist or sabba okay so um, anyway i wanted to make a point that this word is also used in poetry in relationship to journeys but we can skip that uh, we lived in a space or long space of uh, time okay and by the way that's one of the meanings of zulqarnain and because of that some of the scholars says Zulqarnain can mean somebody who lived for 200 years, two centuries, right? So that is uh, one of the things I was going to actually talk about. Uh, period, a period of some days continuous of heat and of cold and severe weather. So that's also Dahrul Sabab, time consisting of vicissitudes. One turn is this and one is this, okay? Subba also means to disagree, to shame, okay? And uh, let's see now. This is the one that, out of the meanings that the brother was using, uh, signifies any rope let down or made to descend from above, or a strong, long rope. But no rope is called except by which, by one by which means of which one ascends and descends. Okay. So this is the meaning that the brother was using. This in appellation is only given to a rope of which one end is attached to the roof or a ceiling, or the like, and by means of which one ascends palm trees. So like you tie a rope to the palm tree and you go up, right? So you have a top and a ceiling that you understand. And we know that, uh, I won't go into the details of more of this, but it, that, that is what, let him stretch a rope to the roof or ceiling of his dwelling and let him die strangled. Yamdud bisababin ila samay thumma yakta. Let him extend the rope to the ceiling or to the high or to these heavens and then let him kill himself. That's mentioned in the Quran. Okay. So he was saying this word sabab is used when having an upward, right? Uh, this is also interesting. If you take it in the sense of upward, then uh, anybody who knows, for example, the um, um, Cyrus the Great, the Cyrus the Great went northward. You know, he went to like the rope moving upward right towards the north pole um uh, so hence a thing or any kind by which a means of which one attains reaches gains access to another um let us now see there is not for me any road or way for him okay mali ilayhi sabab so the word sabab means road okay and saib or uh, sabiba a means used in order to any end, a means by which a thing is brought about, a cause, but more properly, only a second cause, an occasion, an accidental cause, a reason. Haza sababul hadha. This is the cause of such. Okay. Sabab Allahu laka sabab al khair. I mentioned this before. Okay. Qat'at bihim al asbab. That's there too. Uh, some of the other meanings here a desert okay and as you know his third journey was into the desert in traditional uh, tafsir so we would not give i mean this he followed the asbab he went into a desert where there was no water that makes because then it says and they were in a place where there was no covering from the sun a desert or a desert in which no water or in which neither water or herbage is found a tract of land right far extending 
Uh, so this is one of the meanings. Okay. So one meaning is to reach the water. The other meaning is to go across the desert. And both of them are true in the traditional uh, tafsir, land affected by drought. Um, okay. It is all known. It is also known as a meaning he brought it, whereby it is used in and in order to that he might drink it. And this has to do with uh, in relationship. Oh, that uh, that is in relationship to a buying a different word. Um, and the other meaning that we find is a means used in order to say and a means by which a thing is brought and uh, a rope by means of which one reaches or gains access to water or a pathway by which one gains access to water. So because both desert and water are mentioned, the word sabab is, can be connected as far as... So this from the very beginning, right? Because uh, from the very beginning, you have We established him on earth. And whenever this is used in Quran, it means exactly that, that they're established on earth. And this is where the journey then takes place. And when the questioners, meaning the Jews, were asking this question, with what intent were they asking? Were they interested in travels of someone into the intergalactic? Or were they interested in somebody that traveled on earth that had something to do with the Jews? Okay, the Jews, so that's one aspect, okay? Then, uh, let's go back to the Quran. If you look at the text, uh, until he came to the setting of the sun. Whenever this Maghrib al-Shams is used in Quran, it is also used in Quran referring to our sun. When it is not referring to our sun, the Quran uses the word Najm or Kawkab. Okay? And then when it says Taghribu fi Ain al Hami'atin, Ain generally means a spring of water, which is what Sababa is connected to. And he is going to this spring of water. Ain is different from Bahar in a sense. It is a place that is landlocked and the water is in the middle. And it is a place with a landlock of water that when you look at it, the imagery is like it's going into murky water. Okay. And there's one place like that in the area where Cyrus the Great was. Okay. And I'm going to maybe show that to you in just a little bit. But Ain al Hamia, Okay. That murky spring murky water murky water wajada inda haqawma and there he found human being wa qulna ya dhal qarnayn in imma an tu'adhib wa imma tattakhidhum hum husna this whether you punish them or not punish them has absolutely nothing to do with even in an intergalactic uh, interpretation has nothing to do with throwing them into the black hole or keeping them away from the black hole has nothing to do with that it has to do with his sense of justice now uh Again, until he reached the rising of the sun. Now, in this very surah itself, when, do, when else does it mention the sun? It mentions the sun when it's going over the cave. Right? It's referring, the word shams is referring to our sun going over the cave of the Ashab al -Kahab. So, now, the other point is that this idea that human beings ended up in another planet because of a wet dream Adam wasalam had. You know, these are like, the, there's... There's there's no Quranic evidence to make such a narrative. The statements that come have to be filtered through Quran. Inni ja'ilun fil ardi khalif. I'm going to make a khalifa on earth. Minha khalaqnakum. From this dust we created you of the earth. Wa fiha nu'idukum wa fiha minha nukhrijukum taratan ukhra. We created you from this dust and we'll put you back into this earth and we'll bring you out from here. And so the idea that uh, that uh, you know that human beings somehow ended up on another planet, I'll tell you why this is bothering me. Part of the reason this is bothering me because of the blue beam project, where you know that uh, the very very uh, narrative that uh, you know there will be this extraterrestrial uh, coming up on Earth, which is what the narrative that they're pushing. Right For those of you that know, and for those of you that don't know, I'm going to show that to you in a little bit. But the narrative that's being pushed is, you know, the basically, the Messiah is going to come down, or these things from extraterrestrial world are going to come down. And, of course, it comes from them coming from the heaven. Right? And so they're going to come from heaven and say, hey, 
We got all the answers for you. And this is how they're going to lead people astray. And if you look at what's happening in Israel regarding aliens and what's happening in America and what Trump has been saying and so on and so forth, all this, you know, people talking about aliens coming down to earth, it's all preparation for Jesus will come from heaven, right? Uh, the false Messiah will c come from heaven. And so you're opening up these doors to these thoughts and these ideas that don't really fit Quran. But I will say they have some credence. And I'll talk about that in, later on. But it's not the actual narrative of the story. You know, for me, once a word is used in Quran, so if sababa means something extending to the heavens, number one, and other ayat talk about something going into the heavens, so there's something there. But this is not the story. It has nothing to do with the story. And especially has nothing to do with the imagination of something intergalactic. There's absolutely no reason to believe that um, and if there are weak hadiths saying there was intergalactic space travel there are also weak hadiths that say that there were not that he was on earth so and it cancels out all of those weak hadiths that talk about any space time travel type thing because remember weak hadiths are sometimes interjected into our tradition by the work of shaitan like for making us forget about that Kustuntunia is the real word not Istanbul right uh, so many issues that have come into the hadith literature that you have to really filter through Quran because Allah has made Quran for guidance and uh, you know and then you filter it through Quran if you filter the weak hadith through Quran you'll all those hadiths that talk about some sort of intergalactic uh, space travel they would be removed because he was placed on earth then the question is what was his relationship in terms of asbab what was Fir'aun trying to do when he was going on top of the tower, right? And what are others trying to do when they're trying to go up? What are they trying to do, right? Because Fir'aun wasn't doing it in a positive way. And other times it's mentioned, it's not mentioned in the positive way. Okay, so I will talk about that maybe towards the end. But I want to first uh, go through this and mention a few things. Number one, that insan is ashraf al-makhluqat. And insan was sent on earth. Anyone who says that, you know, somehow Adam had a wet dream and it went to another planet and those people are strange and they're going to come to this earth, that doesn't hold any credence whatsoever because that contradicts Quran. The fact that Zulqarnain is established on the earth contradicts the weak hadith. The fact that, uh, you know, that the progeny of Adam is anywhere other than earth contradicts all the hadiths that talk about how the creation of Adam had happened on earth and how we will be returned back to uh, to dust. Okay. Minha khalaqnakum wa fiha nu'idukum. Right? Anyone that dies eventually ends up somewhere on earth. Uh, somewhere in the in, in, in the earth. So um those things don't hold up. So in San is so there's no other creature that is traditionally known to be mukallaf, responsible. Uh, other than the angels, jinns, and humans. And uh, to say that, uh, uh, to, to say that, you know, somehow human beings reached another planet and they're going to come back opens the gateways for actually this false messiah to come down and say he's part of this whole process in the negative sense of the word. Now, uh, notice also the words in ayah number 94. They said, oh, Inna ya'juj wa ma'juj, ya'juj and ma'juj mufsiduna fil ard. They're causing chaos on the land of the earth. Okay? Now the word earth is used for Jannah. But Allah says, Yawma tabaddul al ardu ghayr al ard. The day we will change the earth to another earth. But this earth, the ard, in fact, the English, what is, uh, the English word earth, comes from the Arabic word Ard. قَالُوا يَا ذَا الْقَرْنَيْنِ They said, إِنَّ يَعْجُوجَ وَمَعْجُوجَ They're causing fasad where? فِي الْأَرْضِ In the earth. When? At his time. At that time. فَهَلْ نَجْعَلْ لَكَ خَرَجًا Should we give you a tax? Now tell me, uh, if there's some aliens somewhere out there, are they going to also have buying and purchasing? They're, they're going to have buying and purchasing and they're going to say to somebody like Dhulqarnin, uh, hey, we're going to pay you tax. Uh, 
it doesn't add up, at least in my mind. هل نجعل لك حرجا على أن تجعل بيننا وبينهم سد that you put a barrier between us and them. Now, is this barrier metaphorical or is it real? Uh, this is a long discussion. In my opinion, this wall is already there. I have had programs about this. We know where this wall is. We know it has metal in it because it's it's like uh, uh, the uh, one day when I talk about this in detail, actually the oxidation in there, in that whole area. Uh, but this... But this wall is real, and uh, we know where this wall is. Okay, Rabbi Khair. And not only that, what the brother failed to mention is this was the opinion of Omar bin Khattab. He sent a group of people to look at that wall, and they came back and said, "We found the wall." And so I have videos already on this. So and then uh, to say Ain al Hamiatin is black hole. This is a little too far fetched. Uh, and then he says, look, what Allah has established me on, Allah has empowered me, is better. right? So come here, help me. Why is he helping, telling them to help him? So that they'll know how to make the wall and fix the wall whenever it's breaking. Okay? al-hadid. He has these things of hadid and copper that we have on earth. There may be these things like iron and so in other places too. So now, This is the rahmah of my Rabb. فَإِذَا جَعْوَادُ رَبِّي When the promise of my Rabb happens, جَعْلَهُ دَكَّ Allah will cause the wall to come down. Now let me ask you this. The brother gave a very good argument. He said from the hadith, if it was a concrete wall, then after they break it, how does it reconstruct itself? But if it's gas, then what? Then they will not be able to see through the gas. But the brother forgot to mention that if there is a wall made of gas, you can pierce through it. You can go through it. It's just gas, right? And so, uh, if they have enough technology to know and to, to talk and to communicate and to know that we need a barrier, they don't have enough technology or understanding that you know, if we have an oxygen tank, we can go through this wall, for example. So, you know, these things, they they don't add up traditionally. Now, uh, I want to talk about what does the Islamic tradition, the different ahadis, what do they say about Dhul Qarnayn and what do they say about the, this this whole issue? And one issue one of this uh, the brother raised up is Ya'juj and Ma'juj will not come till Isa a.s. comes. Okay. Uh, this is completely incorrect. Whoever has this opinion is completely incorrect. And then lastly, I want to talk about the opinion that, what, why are Ya'juj and Ma'juj in the majority? Okay, and actually, let me start with that. The very simple explanation is not that, you know, they're living in another space and they're going to have a lot more children than us and then they're going to come invade us and cause havoc. This is not it. Rather, what it is, is you are of the people that you follow. And so Ya'juj and Ma'juj are human beings, as you'll see. And those human beings, whoever followed their way, that global lifestyle, everyone, billions and billions and billions of people are following their lifestyle. That's Ya'juj and We're part of the Ya'juj. We are part of the Ya'juj Ma'juj culture. We're part of the Judeo-Christian civilization. And so the whole world has been put into facade by the same civilization. And so now, let me just... Uh, uh, mention a few things inshallah ta'ala so in terms of the ahadith and in the tafsir literature for example Imam Tabari and Imam Tabrisi says he was a Roman and he established the city of Alexandria Skandaria okay other narrations for example uh, Imam Tabari for example mentions what? that he was an angel or that he was a king according to Imam Tabari and uh, Qurtubi, rahimahumullah, they, uh, they said that an angel came down and took him to the heavens, you can say, and showed him the whole of the universe, including all of the earth, where he could see his city and everything that was happening. So you can say this was a type of mi'raj, or a type of ascending into, it was, it was an event that happened, but it's like not, uh, it's an event that happened. And this is what uh, this brother is referring to.
And some of the Mufassirin, like Imam Razi, Imam Zamakshari, they say, no, he was a righteous servant of Allah. He was a king. He was a just king that Allah had given wisdom to and knowledge to and authority to. And that's it. So, so you know, some say that he was an angel because Umar bin Khattab said, don't name your children. Somebody named their child Dhul Qannain. Umar bin Khattab said, don't name your children after angels. Some said he was a prophet because Quran is talking to him like he is a prophet. Right? And so, others, uh, other other narrations say, for example, uh, I think it's Imam Tabari who mentions uh, that uh, night and day or in light and darkness were put in his control. And Imam Razi says that he would have light at night and he would have darkness when he wanted to be protected, so on and so forth. I think fourth of Sears mentioned the fact that he would have uh, horns on his head. One of the tafsirs, uh, Imam Zamakshari mentions this, Imam Razi mentions this, Imam uh, Qurtabi mentions this, Imam Tarbarisi mentions this. Um, and one of the tafsirs mentions that uh, he was killed and then resurrected. Another, he was killed and one of the horns was dropped and then he was resurrected and then the other horn was cut off. And then he finally died. Other other tafsirs say he he didn't die. He was alive after that. So, so much is being said, right? So when one is looking at all of these ahadiths, the first thing you have to do is you take all these hadiths through the Quranic verses. Some narrations say he's called Zulqarnain because he combined the uh, Persian and the Roman Empire. Say because he traveled to the east and to the west, like these are two horns of the earth, according to I think it was Imam Razi who said this. Imam Razi also records a dream that he had in which he came close to the sun until he came to a place where he was able to grab the right and the left horns of the sun, and after that he was called Zulqarnain. Imam Zamakshari, who is the master of the Arabic languages, uh, Arabic language says, uh, you know, the two horns represent fearlessness, so he's Zulqarnain. Other scholars said that it was his helmet of his being the king. Some of the commentators of Tafsir said he is Zulqarnain because he he lived for two centuries, which is, uh, you know, which is speculation, and there's no narration on it, but that's what some of the scholars said. So these, so when you have all these different opinions, I think it's like more than fifteen. What do you have to do? You have to take it through the Quran, and you have to then look at the people asking the question. Now, the brother says, oh, why are we looking at Ya'juj and Ma'juj from the Bible? Because of Min... And then he also makes the point, it doesn't say Ya'juj and Ma'juj. It says Gog of Magog. Okay? And and then he gives it one of the biblical interpretations when the Bible commentators itself give Gog Magog many different interpretations. When you say Gog of Magog, a people and the land of the people, it means the people of that land and their king or their leaders. Okay, So you can have many, many meanings, uh, but the brother didn't look at all the different possible meanings. Also, the brother uh, didn't look into or is not aware of that not is only Gog Magog mentioned in the Bible. And who's asking the questions of people of the book? So where did they get their information from? They got it from the Bible. This is why it's it's not just Oh, the Bible says this, and therefore it, uh, you know, has some significance. Israeliyat have significance, but it's even more significant in this case that they're asking a question from their book that they had at that time, which is the same as the book we have today. So the question is: Zulqarnain mentioned in the Bible? Yes, Zulqarnain as Zulqarnain is mentioned in the Bible, and I've shown this before, but I'm going to show it today in this context of. Also showing you Ya'juj and Ma'juj. So, first of all, uh, this word Qarnain. And over here, instead of Dhul Qarnain, in this particular verse, he's called Sahibul Qarnain, the man of the two horns. Okay, so, and uh, again, the Qarn of the, uh, now let me show you. Amma Kabash, as for the ram, alladhi ra'aytuhu, that I saw in my dream, he said, Dhul Qarnain, he Dhul Qarnain, huwa maluk. He is from the kings of Madi and Faris. This is Cyrus the Great who brought these two kingdoms together and freed the Jews to go back to Jerusalem, which is why he is considered the non-Jewish Messiah. 
because he freed the Jews and brought two kingdoms together and gave freedom to the Jews and supported the Niyad alayhi I've done many lectures on this, so I'm just paraphrasing here right now. You can go and look at those, okay? Uh, so this word, Qarnayn, Zal Qarnayn is used where? It's used in the Bible. Now let's look at Ya'juj and Ma'juj. So in the book of Ezekiel, it says, Ya ibn Adam, O child of Adam, Ij'al wajhaka ala juj al-ard. The land of Juj and Ma'juj, Ra'is. These are the prince and the people in charge. Rushul Mashik wa Tubal. And they are the kings, or you can say the people in charge of this place called Mashik and Tubal. Okay. And uh, then it is also in the Bible in other places. I'll show you one more. And over there in the in 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 Revelations, it actually mentions Ma'juj in verse uh, Banu. Uh, this wa uh, Ma'juj wa Ma'di. Okay, Ma'juj is mentioned in this part of the Bible, and Juj Juj al Ard is mentioned in this part of the Bible. Okay, and in fact, what I want to share with you is that. While it says Gog, uh, the land of Magog, Juj and Ya'juj, or Juj, uh, Ya'juj and Ma'juj, uh, but there are the older scriptures that they have found now, especially the Dead Sea Scrolls, that mention them together as Ya'juj and Ma'juj. So this is something that needs to be looked into and studied, but the point I'm trying to make is who are the people asking these questions to the Prophet? They are the people who are aware, they are Ahlul Kitab, they are aware of what their book says. And they're asking the Prophet based upon that. And the book that they have mentions Zul Qarnayn, mentions Ya'juj and Ma'juj. So that they would, and the answer that would be given to them would be given to them so they can confirm if it's true or not. If some intergalactic story is given, then you would have to be able to find an intergalactic story in the Bible. It's just as simple as that, because once you understand that the Bible they had at the time of the Prophet is the same Bible we have today. So the, if they're asking questions from the Bible, then the answer that they have to give, either be like, you know, you, did, you didn't answer our question. But it has to be answered in the Bible. And the Prophet doesn't know the Bible. It has something to do with the Bible. And over here, I want to share with you an important point. So, first of all, if you're going to ask somebody a test question, you have to know the answer. Or you're looking for something, so you know part of the answer and you're looking for more. So, Cyrus the Great was a non-Jewish Messiah. Why? Because he let the Jews go back to Israel. This is why they compare him to who? Compare Donald Trump to Cyrus the Great. Why? Because Donald Trump gave the Israel, the Jerusalem as the capital. Okay? And so... Uh, the story, when you look at all the ahadiths and filter it through the Quran, it doesn't really add up. But, I will say, what does add up is that, since the word sababa is used, and since there are some weak hadiths that talk about him going into the heavens, and since there are weak hadiths that talk about him going to the heavens, and the word sababa is used, and the word asbab and sababa have some connection with going upwards, so there is something there that happened in his life that has to do with that because Allah said, well, And we gave him the power to go or the means to all things. So he had his spiritual ascent also. And you can say like Mi'raj, he probably had an angel take him and show him uh, that what you have conquered is nothing in comparison to the whole universe. So I'm just saying, I mean, that's not exactly what was probably said but maybe there was an event just because an event took place in someone's life doesn't mean that's the story that's being mentioned in Quran so just say and then I wanted to answer about Ya'juj and Ma'juj Ya'juj and Ma'juj is used in the old Bible number one number two that the question has to come from the Bible the answer has to be partially in the Bible because they're asking the prophet to test if he's a real prophet Right, And so, this is why the biblical narrative is important in this case. Because the Qur'an is muhaymin alayk. The Qur'an corrects the Bible. And the Qur'an would have said, what you, as it has in many places, the Qur'an will give you a different story than the Bible to correct the Bible. But what we find is, there's actually, over here, collaboration. 
there is consistency between the Bible and the Quran in many of the stories, in many aspects of many of the stories. So to totally deny it is not the prophetic way, meaning it's not what the Prophet taught us, especially not at the scholarly intellectual perspective. Now, going back to the uh, surah, okay, uh, yes, alunak, O Prophet, they ask you, the Jews are asking you, and Allah is aware who is asking, and what type of answer they're looking for, to confirm he's a Prophet. And Dhul Qarnayn, they ask you about Dhul Qarnayn, Kul Sa'atlu Alaykum Minhu Dhikra, we'll tell you, we'll mention, or give you some information about him. Innama Kannahu Fil Ard, he's that man that we established on earth, he was a established authority on earth like Yusuf was. Okay. min kulli shayin sabab, and you gave him the ability to follow all paths because sababa also means a path. And there's the other thing that sababa doesn't necessarily have to be upward. That's one of the meanings, but it can also be across a desert. It can also be to go to reach water, right? Fatba'a sababa. Until he reached a place where there was water. And then after that, he reached a place where there was a desert. And after that, he came to a people who, uh, after that, he came to Ya'juj and Ma'juj. Where were they causing fasad? In the earth. So there's no need to go to the point of saying this was something intergalactic. Now, as far as the, uh, as far as uh, this part is concerned, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad, that Ain al Hamiyati. Okay. If you can in reality find Ain al Hamiyati on earth. Okay. If you can find Ain al Hamiyati actually on earth, then you have to assume the wall is also on earth because this is part of this. If he's traveling, if the wall, if the Ain al Hamiyati, okay, is on earth, which I'm going to show you in a second, this is the landlocked lake that is. 30% of the water in Armenia, okay? It is like murky water, literally, okay? It's like literally murky water, okay? And it actually looks like the sun is setting into this murky water. And it is a place where, like the Ashabul Kaf, a place where there was a lot of orthodox original Christianity, okay? So you can look up the pictures yourself and you can see for yourself. Uh, let me show this to you on a map. So this is Lake Sivan. And uh, you know in Persian, Siva, Siya means black, right? So this is like a really lock. This is landlocked, okay? And this is a very black sea, you know, compared to uh, other places. But it's fresh water. And that's the other meaning of the word Ain when it is used for water. Ain al Hami, it's black, but it is fresh water. We don't use the word Ain for salt water in the Arabic language. So it has to be fresh water. And over here, the meaning itself literally, okay, means fresh water that's landlocked, okay, that looks black. And that is this place where. Zulqarnain came and established, uh, he came first here, okay, before he went to the uh, the place where um, Ya'juj and Ma'juj were. Now, what do we know about Ya'juj and Ma'juj from another perspective? I gave you the biblical perspective, but what about secular studies? Like, for example, does the secular word world have anything to say about Ya'juj and Ma'juj or Gog and Magog? And do they say about themselves that we are the people of Gog and Magog, right? So now let's look at that. So the point I wanted to make is that, you know, black hole is a metaphorical interpretation for which you have to establish proof, but there is an actual lake on earth that fits that description, okay, that is, uh, that fits that description and even has the name of what? Uh, Sia, which means black. And the second possibility is a landlocked lake like the uh, Black Sea, okay? Uh, but uh, I, if I was to choose between uh, the two, it seems more like uh, Armenia's uh, Sivan Lake, Sia, is fits better. But though that's not the point. The point is there are places on Earth that fit that description. 
So why do we have to make it into a black hole? Okay. And if the reason is as the word sababa, then the word sababa has many meanings, including traveling to the sea, which would be, or traveling to water, which would hold this meaning, including traveling over the, the desert, which is, and can be easily understood that they had no, they had no covering from the sun because it was the desert and there was no trees and there was no shade. Okay. So, but now let's look at Ya'juj and Ma'juj from the perspective of uh, secular. Okay. So this author, author, his name is Arthur Kolstler. He wrote the 13th tribe and he wrote this book in order to, because of anti-Semitism, Europe was having very negative feelings towards the Jews. So he wrote this book, look, we are Jewish European. We are the Gog Magog. Okay. And so they themselves have talked about this. There's several places in Europe that, uh, have uh, the name of uh, Gog Magog. And I'll just give you one or a few examples of that. So, for example, you know, the Europeans have this Gog Magog uh, Hills, which is a famous hill in Cambridge in the UK, right? And they have parades by the name of Gog Magog. They have uh, so many things. They even have, you know, these pictures of Gog and Magog in their parades, for example. So, it, it's, it's all over Europe. Anybody that uh, has an understanding of the European uh, civilization understands this is something they're actually proud of and, and that they have acknowledged. Um, and the narrations that, uh, in fact, there's one brother, he's a scholar, he's written a book on the topic, but the narrations that Ya'juj and Ma'juj are Europe, of European descent, those narrations are a lot stronger than any of the hadiths that we're quoting about uh, intergalactic uh, space travel. So all in all, this is what I feel. I feel that, you know, the plethora of evidence that shows Ya'juj and Ma'juj are related to the uh, the the Scythia and they're part of the of the Khazai tribe, the European tribes that accepted Judaism and then intermixed with Banu Israel and that they have they have caused facade and chaos in the world. And uh, you're overlooking the obvious, right, of what's happening before our eyes. And you're interested in the intergalactic uh, space travel based upon a very uh, not a universally fitting uh, from the perspective of the people that were asking the question how they had to have an answer to part of the question when you look at the مَكَنَّهُ فِي الْأَرْضِ in the Quran when you look at they wanted to pay Zulqarnain they had that tradition uh, that these people were not in out in space right uh, that uh, sababa means to go to water, it means go across the land, it means to go through any road, right? And so he had the means to go on any road, any pathway that he wanted on earth. And that, <coughs> so you're, so I think, you know, trying, it's, it's really, what's a good word? I think it's playing, but not exactly playing because I think there's a serious endeavor here. Um, it answers a few questions you can say that were missing. How will they have large ears? How will there be so many? And how will we be so few? And what people don't realize is many wars are to come. And the Arabs, the Prophet said this, the Muslims and the Arabs will be few in number. And so this new Judeo-Christian civilization will be bigger and Muslims will be smaller. And uh, Mus there going to be literally so many more of them compared. And then the other thing that is hard to answer is about the wall. But I have a, a video of a brother who studied the issue about 15 years. I think he answered the question perfectly. And when the prophet woke up that night and he said, today they put a gap on the wall. We know the exact date, what event happened. And uh, I think it's Abdurrahman, brother Abdurrahman, he did 15 year research on this and he pinpointed to the exact date in in the the the, the or the exact uh, time when the prophet said this and what events were occurring at that time on earth so when you look at the evidence uh it is clear alhamdulillah that um this is referring to phenomenon happening in the world today oh there's one question i forgot to answer so i'm going to answer that now where where will yajuj and majuj be here before isa or after isa
So let's look at this uh, issue. As for the narrations that have at least uh, some level of isharatun nas, that they will be humans on earth, okay? Uh, the Prophet said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, after perhaps the killing of Ya'juj and Ma'juj, sayuqidu al-Muslimun min qaysi Ya'juj wa Ma'juj. The Muslims will kindle fire using the bows of Ya'juj and Ma'juj, right? And uh, for how, how long, uh, and there, um, and there, Shields, okay. One who shall be him, what are you see? him, Sabaasinin. So the Muslims are going to use the bows, arrows, and shields of Ya'juj and Ma'juj. The question is if they're intergalactic entity out there, why are they using human technology? If they have the technology to move from that land to this land. And if things are going to happen at the level of technology, then why are they with bows and arrows? And the Prophet gives a specific one is, you know, to say they, uh, the Muslims will use bows and arrows. And you can give an interpretation of that. It doesn't mean bows and arrows. But when the Prophet says, Sayyuqadu, they will put up fire using this. Now it's very specific. So you can't give a metaphorical trans uh, explanation. Muslims are going to use fires make fire from their bows and arrows that they made out of wood and trees. That shows Ya'juj and Ma'juj would be, what? From the people of the earth. Okay, let's look at another tradition of the Prophet wasallam. that at least at the level of Hishalat nas it shows that um, they are human beings. Okay, if there are these intergalactic beings, uh, how many Muslims would leave their house? Muslims are not leaving their house because of this circus 19. You think if there's a big fat eared being that Muslims will go for Hajj and Umrah? So the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Even after Ya'juj and Ma'juj come out, what? People will continue to do Hajj and Umrah. So Ya'juj and Ma'juj are there and people are doing so their their facade is not is gonna have different levels. Like the hadith in Sayyid Bukhari mentions, the last of them will say the first of us drank all the water of Lake Tiberius. And we already know Lake Tiberius has gone halfway down, then recently has come back up. So it's already in a, in a state of volatility. Okay. So Muslims are gonna use their shields, their arrows, which is human technology. Muslims will continue to do Hajj and will not fear them, meaning they won't be in that fear that some big monster is going to come eat us, right? And then they themselves will say what? They will say, لَقَدْ كَانَ بِهَذِهِ مَرْعَ مَاءٌ ثُمَّ يُسِيرُونَ حَتَّى يَنْتَهُوا إِلَىٰ جَبَلٍ خَمَرٍ So, uh, and they will go to the Jabal al-Bayt al-Maqtas, but what will they say? يَقُولُونَ لَقَدْ قَتَلْنَا مَنْ فِي الْأَرْضِ We have destroyed everyone on earth. We fought everyone on earth. فَحَلَّمَّا فَنُقَتِّلْ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ And they will point their arrows and they'll say, okay, now we're going to kill everybody in the heavens. If they came from the heavens, then it's more logical. They destroyed everything in the heavens and they come on the earth and say, we destroyed everything in the heavens and now we're on earth. We're going to destroy everything on earth. So they're using, again, uh, human technology Okay, let us now kill those who are in the sky and they will throw their arrows towards the sky. Now, because it doesn't say they'll kindle fire, just use, it could be any technology, metaphorically speaking, it's a possibility, towards the sky. And the arrows would return to them besmeared with blood. In the narration of Ibn, uh, Ibn Hujr, uh, I, I have sent such persons that have, none would dare to fight against them. Meaning, the Muslims cannot overcome them. And so Isa alayhi salatu wasalam will tell them to go to the mountains. So more closely the evidence is what? That they are human beings, just like human beings. They carry bows and arrows. Muslims can do hajj and umrah while they're there. There's, there, there could be present and there will be no sense of fear. Now tell me, what do you understand from the hadith that says they're behind a barrier, but yet the Prophet is saying Muslims will do hajj and umrah 
in a sense of safety while these things are out if they are monster or weird looking human beings which could actually happen more likely through cloning and stuff like that than this impossibility of intergalactic travel finally I want to mention the ayah of the Quran يَا مَعْشَرَ الْجِنِّ وَالْإِنسِ نِسْتَطَعْتُمْ أَنْ تَنْفُذُ مِنْ أَقْطَارِ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ فَالْفُذُ لَا تَنْفُذُنَا إِلَّا بِسُلْطَانِ O oh, you community of men and jinn, go! You cannot except with sultan, with great power and great authority. And sultan is used in the Qur'an in the positive sense. That if you are, even the shayateen were stopped from going into the heavens, right? To listen to the angels. You can't go back up there now except unless you have sultan, you have power, you have authority. وَجَعَلْنَا مِنْ لَدُنْكَ سُلْطَانًا نَصِيرًا In authority given by Allah, permission given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you can be outside the earth. So the idea that human beings left this place and the Prophet sallam was sent to all of humanity, how will this portion of humanity that's on another planet receive the message of Prophet Muhammad sallam? So it goes completely against the, the you could say, the basic tenets and uh, if you look at the story, the it's a, it, it's an interesting way of looking at it, but you have to construe the meaning of sabab to its its main usage to something specific. Number two, you have to change ainul uh, hamia to a from something that is seen on earth to something metaphorical. Then you have a whole bunch of Things like they want to pay you a reward, a khuruj, a tax. These are human acts. Fighting with bows and arrows and shields is human acts. And that will perform hajj and umrah while they're here on earth. It's human. In fact, now that I've made this link with European people, let me also share with you the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, where the Prophet says, تَقُوم, تَقُوم السَّعَى the hour will not happen until the Romans are the majority of the people. Okay, And the people who are of Ya'juj and Ma'juj are specifically the Judeo-Christian civilization that represents the Protestant Zionist movement, right? the Anglo-Saxon Khazari Jews, Yiddish-speaking Jews who went now back, to, that got permission at the, at the right time to come from nor northern regions from every height they come down now to Jerusalem. Okay, this is the uh, the, the Yajuj and Majuj civilization, which Muslims are also part of, and that's why the Prophet said that one out of a thousand will be a part of that because there are very few people that live a lifestyle that is at least not fifty percent there. So uh, I did this so that uh, maybe this will uh, help people uh, assess and think more deeply about how to integrate the whole big picture in answering a specific question. Because if you don't look at the bigger macro picture and you look at the specific, you can get lost in many different ideas. You have to make sure that it's consistent from the top to the bottom. Okay, If it's intergalactic, human beings living in some other place, then no message of a messenger has reached them. Then, if they're part over there, why are they using human technology, right? If they're over there in the intergalactic world, then wh why is it necessary that this Ainul Hamia is necessarily a black hole? Why can't it be another star? And then he mentioned punishing. What does it have to do with black hole? A king can punish anyone at any time. So there are too many loopholes. But this is what happens when you become tunnel visioned. And uh, this happens even to intellectuals. Uh, everything I've ever heard from this brother has been great, except this one point in which I didn't like it. He even mocked the scholars. And I think that's why uh, he didn't get it right as much as he may have been able to get it right. Um, so anyway, this is something for everyone to consider.